What we're going to talk about tonight is the hardest possible job any human being could have. There's nothing tougher than raising up our kids. There's nothing tougher than trying to raise our kids up in this culture. And I am absolutely convinced we can't do it unless we pray. Praying is the basis of every tough decision we can make as a parent. Praying can give us the courage to stand up when we have to and to sit down when we should. Praying can give us the words we need to say to our children. And praying can give us the knowledge we need to not say a word. And that's the way we can get through this overwhelming and very, very challenging job that we have. And that's why we're all here tonight. We're going to talk about praying tonight. We're going to talk about some very specific things that we can do as parents that can make a difference in our children's lives. I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the troubles that we're seeing that kids are having, some of the struggles that they're in, and uh, what I'm seeing in the population of kids that I'm working with. And then we're going to talk about how should we respond, what's our job, where should we draw the line. Now I ask kids, about 8,000 kids a, a year, those exact same questions I asked you. What are the three biggest problems facing teenagers? I ask kids in every kind of community you can imagine. I go to very, very seriously impoverished inner city kids, and I go to kids whose parents work the farm and are home on the land all day. I see kids of enormous affluence. One of the schools I go to, the girls come in their limousines in the morning, and I see kids who don't get lunch unless they're on the lunch program at school. So I see a very, very big cross-section of kids. I ask them all these questions I asked you, and I get three answers. Drugs and alcohol, sex, and pressure. That's it. Doesn't matter where you live. Doesn't matter how much money your parents have. It doesn't matter if you're a seventh grader or an 11th grader. Drugs, alcohol, sex, and pressure are the three things that our kids are struggling with enormously today. And they are struggling. The statistics bear up very, very much that what the kids feel is happening in their life is the truth. That they're seeing kids that are making bad decisions, they're worried about kids that are making bad decisions, and they're not exactly sure how to make the good decisions themselves. Because it seems like everyone they know is doing things they shouldn't be doing. So we have drugs, sex, and pressure. What do they think we as parents can do about it? This is the window into their hearts. The most common answer is my parents should talk to me. The simplest thing. Not at all, is it? It's actually the hardest thing. It's easy to talk to our kids about being sure their teeth are brushed and talking to our kids about being sure that the laundry's in the hamper and that the table is set and that their chores are done. It's hard to sit down and talk to our kids about drinking at parties. It's hard to sit down and talk to our kids about smoking marijuana. It's hard to sit down and talk to our kids about their sex lives. That's hard stuff to do. It seems like, of course, talking. That's what the kids think, of course, talking. They think we ought to start talking to them by fifth grade about these subjects. They want us to start opening the doors in fifth grade so that they can ask questions, so that they can wonder about something. So how do we do that? How do we become askable parents? Let me give you a few little communication tips, some of my favorites. Okay? We should try and have dinner together as often as possible. Dinner where we sit down at the dinner table, at least one parent and as many kids as you can possibly assemble at the dinner table. I know it's hard. I, we have tonight from 6.30 to 8.30, one of us is at dancing lessons. So when do you eat dinner? At 5.30 or 9 o'clock. You have to make that decision if you're all going to sit down at the dinner table together. And I'm sure every single one of you has examples of this in your own life, of other things that are crowding in on the dinner table. Make your meal a priority. Last year in our state, there were billboards all over the state that said, have dinner together once a week. The state of Connecticut is encouraging us to have dinner together with our kids once a week. 
How well are we going to know somebody we only sit down with once a week? We're not going to know anything about them. We're not going to know what they like or what they don't like. Even if you don't discuss a single issue of import at dinner, you learn stuff. You learn how your children think. Very important thing to know because it's different than us. We don't think like kids. We did when we were kids, but we're not kids anymore. So we have to listen to them to understand. And a meal is the place to do that. Now, some families say our schedule is su such we don't get dinner, so we all get up early and have breakfast together. Great. Everybody at the table sharing a meal. That's what we're aiming towards. I'm a personal fan of dinner because it's kind of the end of the day and the worries of the day and what's heavy on your heart. Dinner's kind of a nice way to get some feedback on how the day went, but a meal a day, certainly. That's one very important communication tip. You don't even have to say much. You just have to be there. That's all you have to do is be at the table. Just don't be reading. Just be there looking at your children. And that's really all it takes. So meals, that's number one. The second hint I want to give you about communication is the car. How many of you spend most of your time driving your children around in the car? It is the best place on earth to have conversation about tough stuff. Your child can look out the window and you're driving. You don't have to make eye contact. You love this. It's so nice. If you're in the car alone with your child, turn the radio off. Now here's a tip from a parent. If you're in the car with a car full of kids, turn the radio on so that they have to speak up over the sound of the radio so that you can hear them. Not because you're nosy and you have to find everything out, but so that you know what's going on in your child's life and so that you know what's going on with their friends. It's not eavesdropping, it's fact gathering. There's a difference. Okay? Might be slim, but there is a difference. Mm -hmm. The car is a great, great place to have conversation. It's great to drive your kids' friends' places if you can. It's so nice to have a whole bunch of them in the car. Even those of you with the little tiny ones, you get them all in the car, you hear them, you just learn things. It's so nice, it's so fun. So the car, so we have the dinner table, we have the car, and we have Janine's favorite place to talk, and that's at bedtime, okay? And this is one of my favorites too. I strongly recommend that we as parents tell our kids when it's time to go to bed. Right? Even our big kids. My son, who is in the audience tonight, hates this, that we say, hey, time to go to bed. He doesn't like this at all. He's a senior in high school. He should be deciding when he goes to bed himself. We don't let him do that. <laughs> we say no. We like to have a little time as the mom and dad after everybody settled down. We like to have the house quiet into ourselves for a little bit, so we like to get everybody into bed. One of the things that really worries me about bedtime is when I see the fifth graders and the sixth graders, the little ones, and they're up watching television shows at 10 o'clock at night. Now, one of the things that we know about middle school and high school kids is they're growing. You have a child that's this big on Monday and this big on Wednesday if you have an eighth grade son. And their bodies need an enormous amount of energy to grow. And guess how they get that energy? When they're sleeping. So that bedtime isn't just important, although we like it for ourselves, it's also important for their physical health as well as their mental health. How well do any of us cope when we're exhausted? Not very well at all. School's harder, thinking's harder, the problems with your friends are harder, your decisions are harder when you're tired. When you're rested, everything is easier to cope with. And with teenagers, coping requires an enormous amount of their energy. Coping with the onslaught of their friends, with what this one's doing, what that one's doing. If you have daughters, they have someone mad at them every day. Someone leaving them out, someone not talking to them, this and that. So those poor girls, they need their rest. They have to cope, especially if they're in seventh and eighth grade. They've got to sleep because their friends are going to be mean to them and they need to be able to stand that. So this is my suggestion for bedtime. You send your kids to bed. You say, go to bed. It's time for bed. And they complain and they argue and you say, I'm sorry, you're not happy. Go to bed. Okay? And you send them to bed. And you, when, they, when you send them to bed, they don't get to watch TV anymore. Actually, what I really would suggest strongly is that there are no televisions in your children's bedroom. I strongly suggest there's no televisions in your children's bedroom. But we'll get to that when we talk about the culture. I don't, I'm not going to get off on that yet because that one gets me. Okay, so that you send your kids to bed, no TV, quiet music, just sort of think about the day. 
think about what you did today, what's going on tomorrow. Give them five, ten minutes in their room. Show up in their bedroom. Who do you love more than anyone on earth? Your children. That, they should know that before they close their eyes and go to sleep at night. They should know that you don't love anyone the way you love them. They should know that today you're glad this is your child. They should know that no one counts more to you than they do before they fall asleep. And when you go into their bedrooms at night, you tell them this. I love you, honey. Big senior in high school, 250 pound football playing boys tell me they want their parents to say I love you every day. Every day. They want it out of your mouth. How much do you like it when someone says I love you to you? Okay. Now, if you're not good at I love you's, and you know whether you are or not, if you grew up in a family where nobody ever said I love you, it might be hard for you. You have to practice. You need to get in the car all by yourself and drive around and say it. I love you. I love you. I love you. I love you. Until you're desensitized to it, and then you can start saying it to your kids. They should hear it from you at the end of the day. Find out how their day was. This is a two-minute event. Stopping into their room, sitting on their bed, telling them how much you love them, asking them how their day was. Good night, honey. I'll see you tomorrow. Two minutes. Okay. It's going to be two minutes for about three months. Then they're going to be waiting for you. And you're going to come. You're going to say good night to your child. It's time to go to bed. And they're going to go up to their room, and they're going to wait for you to show up. And if you don't show up, they're going to say, hey, are you coming up? I'm falling asleep. And you're going to get up to their room, and you're going to sit on their bed, and they're going to have 45 minutes worth of stuff to tell you. You're going to be saying to them, we have to stop this conversation. We have to get some rest. And it takes three months of habit to make the change. Every single night for three months, say I love you and good night to your child in their room, in their bed, and you will have conversations you couldn't even believe. Most parents tell me it's much faster than three months, but I guarantee if you hang in there for three months, it'll happen for you. Now, you go to a football field where there's fourth and fifth graders playing, soccer field, football field, and you know that there's parents there that are dying to touch their kids because all the kids have to do is come over to the sideline and everybody's patting their children. Did you ever notice that? They're patting them on their heads, they're patting them on the back. Everybody's patting their kids at sports all the time, right? We're touching them. We need to keep touching them, and we need to touch them outside of their accomplishments. We need to touch, touch them outside of their role in our family. We need to touch them as our individual child that matters more to us than anything. We moms teach our sons how women should be hugged, how women should be respected, how women should be touched in a way of great affection, never of harm. You dads teach your daughters how a man should never harm her, ever harm her with his words or with his actions. We can do that for our kids, and it's a really nice gift. And while we're doing that, now here I'm circling back around, we're talking about it. Talk, 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 talk. That's what they're asking us to do. So there's my three big communication tips for you. Eat dinner, drive around, and say good night. Not too hard of things to do, but certainly uh, will provide you with a wealth of comfort, of heart happiness, and of conversations you just could never imagine you would have with your child that will give you great delight. So that's the first thing they want us to do. The second thing they want us to do, and when they first started telling me this, I was very, very surprised by it. They want us to discipline them. Discipline them. They're asking us to do our job as parents. They don't mean they want us to punish them. That's not what they mean. They mean they want us to be in charge. If there's anything an adolescent knows, it's that they're not in charge. They know that. They don't feel in control of things. They're not in control of what's going on in their body. Their bodies hurt. Their knees hurt. Their elbows hurt. Their feet change sizes in a month. You notice that? Two, in one month, two sizes of shoes. These kids know they're not in control. They know it. They need to know that we are. Someone has to have a handle on things in their life. It's our job to be that someone. 
So that's something that we do with boundaries, with discipline, not with punishment. The difference between discipline and punishment. Discipline is something you do for and with your child. Punishment is something you do to them. Sometimes punishment is necessary. Punishment becomes necessary when discipline fails. If discipline works, and it doesn't always, it doesn't always, and it doesn't always work not because we're making the mistakes, it doesn't always work because the child isn't in a place where they can handle the structure. But if discipline works, we don't need to punish. We don't need to have yelling and screaming fights. We don't need to be mad at each other. We don't need to be slamming doors. We have structure that helps that. So let me give you a few ideas. Developing habits that require self-discipline around the household is a very helpful way to establish discipline with your child. What is that? Chores. That's what that is, chores. Our kids ought to have chores. Now, in a lot of houses, the lawn service comes and cuts the lawn. The cleaning lady comes and cleans the houses. So those kinds of chores you don't have. You can't send your son out with the lawnmower, and you can't tell your, your son to come in and, and do the dusting. Okay, You can't do that. But we still need to give our children meaningful work that influences the running of the household. Not fake work that doesn't have to be done. Important stuff that alleviates you from doing some of the work. I like setting the table and clearing the table and filling the dishwasher and emptying the dishwasher, taking care of their bathroom, uh, which is not always effective in our house, I hate to say. Hint, hint. Um, taking care of their bathroom, keep picking their clothes up. I'm not, in my house, I'm not a fanatic that their room is cleaned every day. Far from being a fanatic about their room being cleaned every day. But by Saturday nights, I'd like their rooms to be picked up, you know, so that once a week. So that there's a habit there that they have meaningful work that because they do it, you don't do it. Now, you don't do it even if they don't do it the way you want them to. If you want them to fill the dishwasher and they're not perfect about the way they clean the plates before they fill the dishwasher, still let them fill the dishwasher. Don't care about the perfection. Starting when they're small. We're not perfect. We shouldn't expect them to be either. And they still need to do the work. If you don't like the way it's doing, certainly show them, oh gee, you know, you could do it this way and it would work better, but don't do it for them. We're faster at it. We're more efficient at it. We get it done in the way we like. So we say, never mind, never mind, I'll take care of it. Don't do that. Okay? Let them do it. Rules and regulations. I am generally distressed when I talk to kids. In, today I had eighth graders here. And I asked them how many of them had rules about television. Maybe 25% of their hands went up. I asked them how many of them had rules about movies. Even fewer hands went up. How many of them had rules about video games? No hands went up in this audience. Rules are necessary. And rules that protect our kids from the popular culture are very, very important. So I'm going to give you some ideas of some rules that I think are helpful. Obviously, I think a TV rule is very, very helpful. Any kind of TV, TV rule is helpful. I like the no TV rule. That's my favorite one. But obviously, that's not one everybody's going to want to implement. How about like no TV till the homework's done? That's a good rule. How about one show a day? That's a good rule. That helps with decision making. You got to decide. You like three shows. You pick the one you can watch today. I actually would take that even a step further and suggest that you choose a number of shows per week. Each child in this household can pick three shows a week. Each child can pick four shows a week. They have to negotiate with each other about it. They have to work out who's going to watch what. So, oh, you pick this show this week, I'll pick this show this week, and everybody gets to watch their favorites over the course of the week. It really encourages some skill development in the kids. I really want you to pay attention to what they're watching on television and to establish some sort of boundaries and rules about their TV watching. I think a no flipping rule is good. Sorry, men in the, in the room. I know this is very hard on you. Once they go to bed, flip all you want. But I think when they're up in front of the TV, 
Flipping is not a good idea. They're going to stop at different channels than we are. And let me give you a list of the channels they're going to stop at. And this is your first homework for the night. I want you to look at these television channels. Okay? I want you to look at Fox. I want you to look at MTV. I'd like you to look at UPN. I'd like you to look at USA. I'd like you to look at the WB. I'd like you to look at the World Wrestling Federation channel. That's really bad. Okay. I want you to go home tonight or tomorrow night, look at all these channels, and flip around. I want you to stay on each channel to get some show and some commercial. ESPN, all you need is the commercials. You know, the shows are fine. Watch the commercials. Get a feel for what the kids' favorite. These are their favorite channels. This is what they watch. This is what they love. This is their favorite thing. If you're watching these channels, you're seeing what the kids are watching. See what you like on these channels, see what you don't like on these channels, and structure your rules around what you think is okay. You're the ones that decide, okay? You may decide differently than your next door neighbor. You may decide differently than the parents of your children's best friend. You may decide differently than your sister, or your sister-in-law, or your brother. You may make different decisions than them, but you make the decisions. Don't let somebody else influence what your child should or shouldn't be watching on TV, including me. You take a look and you decide. Great discipline right there. That's television. I think it's a good idea to have some rules about movies. And the best rule, the simplest rule, is that if you're not old enough for the way it's rated, you don't get to see the movie. It's easy. Okay? Now, it's hard. It's easy to say. It's hard to do because R-rated movies are marketed to your 13-year-old. R-rated movies are marketed to your 7th and 8th grader. They're not marketed to 17-year-olds. They're marketed to your little kids. And they take PG-13 movies and they add stuff to them so that they can rate them R so that 13 and 14-year-olds want to see it. That's what happens. Pay attention to the movies. Everyone, every single child in this room today had seen at least two R-rated movies since June. Every single eighth grader in this room today had seen at least two R-rated movies since June. When I asked them what their favorite movies were, and there were five kids that were able to, that uh, I would take the responses from, every one of them named a rated R movie. Every single one of them. These kids are 13 years old. And what they're, how they're entertaining themselves is with movies rated R. Have a little discipline about this. I'm going to get back to the movies later. Um, another thing about discipline is dating rules. I'm a big believer in rules about dating, and these are the rules I would suggest. Tailor them to meet the needs of your own family. I think that you shouldn't date till you're 16. If you can't drive yourself there, you don't go, okay? Just as a couple. If there's somebody that you like, that you think is nice and think is cute, and you like to be with them, then you have to be with a bunch of other kids too. So if I'm going to take you someplace, and this girl or boy that you like wants to go there, and you want me to drive them, I would be happy to do that. But who else is coming? I need at least four kids, really preferably five. Fill your seatbelts and bring them all. Okay, I tell the kids that I don't think they should be dating before they're 16 because they don't actually know how to date yet. And you don't actually know what to say, you don't actually know what to do, and you put yourself in a situation where you're trying to act in a way that's pleasing to somebody else instead of trying to be yourself. When you go out with a big group of kids, you get to not only be yourself, you get to see how everybody else is being themselves also. And you get to decide what sort of person do you want to date. Do you like the quiet ones? Do you like the life of the party? Are you someone who is really like someone who could just make a joke in a tough situation and make everything go easy? Or do you find that those serious ones are really attractive to you? You've got to decide what sort of person to date. Otherwise, you know what happens? You date the first person that's interested in you. That's not a way to pick who you date. You want to pick who you date. You don't want just to date anybody. 
And when you go out in a group, you get to make those decisions. What sort of person is good? If you're dating before you're 16, you run into some difficulties. There are expectations that our kids have about dating that start in fifth and sixth grade that we didn't have in our generation. In our generation, when we watch TV, Ricky and Lucy had twin beds and they were married, okay? We didn't think you had sex with someone who you just thought was cute. Okay? Today, they turn on TV at 3 o'clock in the afternoon and the people are naked in the sheets on the television and they're total cultural input is that if you think someone is nice, you have sex with them. They don't know how to date. You know what kids never do anymore? Make out. They don't do it. That was so fun. And they don't do it. They don't make out. Right? They go straight to sex. As a matter of fact, here's real shocking stuff, they don't actually even have to be dating to have sex. In many, many places that I go to, many, many places that I go to, they have parties. This starts in eighth grade, and they are oral sex parties. And they get together. Now, the New York Times claims it starts in fifth grade. I don't see it in fifth graders. Thank you, God. But I do see it in eighth graders. They get together at each other's houses. They drink, maybe smoke a little marijuana, have their music playing. They're in the basement. There's no parents around anywhere. And the girls give the boys oral sex in the room where everybody is. It's not like they go off into another room. It's not like they turn it into something private. The boys ask them to do it, and the girls say, oh, OK, and they do it. Is that shocking? To me, as an adult, it really is. And yet, to them, it's like, well, and I'll say to them, girls will come up to me and they'll tell me this. Oh, last week we were at a party and this happened and now I don't know what to do. They just learned all this terrible news about sexually transmitted disease. And I'll say to them now, you were at a party. Do you know this boy? Well, not really. Were there other people there? Oh, yeah. They don't think that they shouldn't be doing that at a party with a whole bunch of kids in the room. And they don't think that because they're, they've been so desensitized to the wonder of sex. They don't think it's wonderful. They don't think it's wonderful. 80% of teenage girls who have been sexually active regret it. 80%. And by the end of ninth grade, 42% of our kids have had sex. By the end of ninth grade, either intercourse or oral sex. And 80% of those girls are sorry that they've done it, but they're gonna do it again because now it's their habit. It's what they think you do. How can we get our daughters not to do that? We have to talk to them. We have to say something really hard like, you know, you might go to a party someday and some boy might ask you to give him oral sex and you should say, are you kidding me? Not on your life, Buster. Who do you think I am? We need to give our girls those words. We need to say to our boys, I expect you to be a good man. I don't expect you ever, ever to ask a girl to have sex with you if you're not married to her. It's the wrong thing. It puts her at risk. That's not being a good man. I expect you to be a good man. We need to say this to our kids. We need to give them the structure. They sound so savvy to us. They sound like they know everything because they have the lingo. They have the lingo. They know the words. They don't know what the words mean. In my basket of questions today, they wanted to know what horny meant. They wanted to know what oral sex was. They use these words. They don't know what they mean. We have to tell them. And I'm going to tell you, parents, they're so much better off hearing it from your lips than from somebody else's, even mine. I like it when I'm telling kids this stuff and their parents have told them already. And they're sitting in the audience and they're saying, oh, you sound just like my mother. I love that. I really, that makes me so happy. That means their mothers or their fathers are telling them this stuff. And I'm sorry, but we have to start telling them when they're small. We can't wait until they're in high school to do it. And that doesn't mean we have to take our fifth grade, our beautiful, pure fifth grade son, sit him down at the dinner table and say, we're going to talk about oral sex. Okay? <laughs> we don't have to do that. 
But what we do have to do is have enough open door conversations so that as they're getting to things that their friends are up to or that they're reading, if they read something, that they'll say to you, do you know about this? Did you ever hear about this? Of course, they won't imagine that you've ever heard about anything that has anything to do with sex. They count up how many kids you had. They figure that's how many times you did it. That was it, OK? <laughs> that's where they're at. Even seniors in high school are there. They're, they're there. The worst news I give kids, and I give a lot of bad news to kids, the worst news I give kids is that their parents have sex. They are so grossed out by this, you just cannot believe it. The statistic is that the best sex lives in America, the best sex lives in America take place between Christians who have been married for 10 years or more. Okay? So I say this to the kids. The best sex lives in America take place between Christians who have been married 10 years or more. And then I don't say a word. And then you see them <laughs> looking at each other. And then the light bulb goes off in one head. And then somebody goes, Oh, and then they all get it. And then I say, it's even worse, your grandparents too. Ah, that's it, they can't take that. That's like even worse. The parents are bad enough, the grandparents are a real nightmare. <laughs> so they're not fully convinced that you know much about sex. So you might want to let them know that you know a thing or two about it. And the way to let them know is by you bringing it up. Now, how do you bring it up? There's the question. Watch TV with your child. Watch a movie with your child. Listen to their favorite music. You will have ample opportunity to bring up sex. One half an hour television. Watch Friends. That's all. Watch Friends. One episode of Friends, you're going to be able to talk to your child about sex. There'll be lots of opportunities about bad decision making that'll be right there that you can talk to your children about. Monica is perfect to bring up about sex. Um, they need us to bring it up because they're not going to bring it up themselves. They tell me this. I also ask them, um, if your parents are talking to you about these things, are you acting like you're paying attention? And they go, oh, no, no. You know, they say, I say, oh, do you go, oh, come on. Do we have to have this conversation again? And they go, oh, yeah, that's what we do. And I say, well, should your parents keep talking to you anyways? Oh, yeah, they should keep talking to us anyways. They want us to see through them, okay? And we should. We can. We know. We should. We should say, I'm really sorry I have to keep talking about this to you, but please let me just talk to you about this. My kids get particularly mad if my husband brings a subject up that they know is going to bring on one of mom's lectures, you know? <laughs> oh, oh boy, are you going to do that? There she goes again, you know? But you want to keep it up, keep talking about it. And talking about sex isn't the way you stop your child from having sex. Talking about sex isn't the way you get your child to have sex. Talking about sex is one of the things you do that lets your child know you're available to them. Talking about sex is likely to have your child come to you with questions instead of go to their peer group. Talking to your child about drinking doesn't mean your child will never drink, but it means they might think about it twice before they do. You can't believe the thinking of teenagers. Teenagers believe if you you haven't said it, you don't mean it. And when I ask the kids, do your parents need to say to you, don't drink, in order for you to understand they don't want you to drink, they say, yes. So if your parents have, have said to you, have never said to you, don't drink, does that mean you can drink? They say, well, they never said anything, right? They never said anything. We have to say something. Just saying something is protective. So we've got communication and discipline all wrapped up together. A couple of nice ways to think about discipline. Uh, I'm going to give you two, little, two different analogies, and hopefully one of them will, will stick with you. If we think about um, our kids being on a very fast road, and they are, the speed limit on their road is 80 miles an hour. They're on a very, very fast road. They have no guardrails if they don't have us. They're on that road, and sometimes there's a lot of traffic, and sometimes they're having to switch in and out of traffic, and sometimes there's hairpin turns. And if we don't provide those guardrails, they'll go off the road because they're going so fast, and they don't know how to drive yet. We need to be those guardrails. That's one way we can think about ourselves and our discipline. Another way we can think about ourselves and our discipline is that our kids are the Colorado River, and we are the canyon walls.
And the river, in order to maintain its identity, needs the walls to stay in place. If the walls disappeared for the Colorado River, it would become a lake. It wouldn't be able to be what it was meant to be. We're those walls, and our kids are the river. And it's our job to be sure they don't become the lake, that we keep the wall there. So we're talking about our kids and what we're going to be doing to help them with their decision making and how the discipline that we can help them with and the communication that we can help them with and really how much our love protects them. Now I know how much our love protects them because on the third question that I asked the kids, what's the best thing about your family, the most common answer is the love. We love each other, we support each other, we care for one another, we're there for each other. Kids love the love in their house. Unquestionably, it is by far the most common answer I get. The second most common answer I get is something specific about the family that they like. They like um, that their family is funny. They really like it when you're funny. I mean, that's really very popular with the kids, when you can crack a joke, when you can take a rough situation and make it a little light, when you can, you know, I mean, I like to be laughed out of being mad. I like if I'm feeling grouchy that somebody can say something to me that'll crack me up. It makes a lot of things that could be difficult go more smoothly. Our kids like that, too. They like when we laugh. They lo that's very, very common. They like that they're Irish. They like that they're Jewish. They like that they're Italian. They like that everybody plays a sport or everybody plays an instrument. They like something specific about the family. And so what this tells me is that we want to be sure that our kids know specific things about us, right? We should, one of the things we can talk about at the dinner table is the grandmothers, the grandfathers, the aunts, the uncles, the family stories. Kids love to hear when you were growing up. They love this. Even your big giant kids, so many of you are really not nodding your heads, you know. They want to know about when you were a kid. Let me give you a little advice about this. All truths don't need to be told, okay? <laughs> they want to know stories about your childhood, but they don't need to know every gory detail. It's probably not in your child's best interest for them to know that you got drunk out of your mind every weekend during high school. Okay? It's probably not in your child's best interest for them to know that you were promiscuously sexually active. Because they're not looking at you as a 15-year-old doing this stuff. They're looking at you as a 40-year-old doing this stuff. So they're thinking, they're looking at you as an adult. They can't place you back into your childhood. We can't do that with our parents. Why should we expect our children to be able to do it? with us. So tell them stories. Tell them stories about your friends. Tell them about things that went well and things that were a disaster. Tell them about near misses. You know, I made this bad decision and this almost happened to me. Tell them those stories. Fill them in. Now, they really don't want to know, and I'm going to stress this, they really don't want to know about your past sex partners. They do not want this information about you. I ask them, do you want your parents to tell you details about their sex lives before they were married? No way. That's what they look like. No. <laughs> All right. Do you, want, do you want to know, if your parents were wild partiers, do you want to know that? I don't think so. You know, there may be a child or two that wants to know that. Now, you know your kids. When you're having conversations, some of your kids are going to say, well, gee, did you do that? And they're just sincerely interested and they're looking for the lesson that you learned. Other kids are going to say, gee, did you do that? Because they want to get you with it later, okay? So think about the situation that you're in, that you're having this conversation. Think about, look at your whole big picture before you decide what to tell. And you probably already know which child you can tell a lot of stuff to and which child you have to keep um, more things to yourself. And it's perfectly okay to be selective. If you have several kids in the family and one child would like to have a lot of information about you and would use it to their advantage, 
Give them that information. And another child ought not to know a thing. Don't tell them. You can make that decision. If they talk to each other, well, then you have to deal with that when that, when that happens. But you know your kids. Every single one of you in this room, you, knows, you know what you should and shouldn't be telling. But they like to know about the family, the crazy aunts, the funny stories. My father took my son to his hometown and he took him around to all of his haunts, all of the different places that he went when he was a boy. And my son came home that night. His head was this big. My father had handed him a piece of history. And he's never forgotten that. We can do that too. Tell, sh show them the old haunts. Drive past your elementary school if you can. Talk about that stuff. That's fun stuff to know. And it gives them their heritage. They like that. So that's the second most common thing, or the specific things about the family that they like. The third answer is who you are. That's what they like. They like who we are as a family. They like that there's a lot of us. We like that it's just me and my mother. We like that the grandparents live at home. They like that uh, you spend time with the relatives. They like family parties. They like that who we are. So when I ask kids about their families, they, today I was struck by how fast they all wrote their answers down. There are some places where I'll go, and I, and, I, and I get a hint about this. When I go to a new school that I haven't been through before, like a high school, I drive through the kids' parking lot first. If the kids' cars are nicer than the teachers' cars, I know that when I ask them what they like best about their family, they're going to have a hard time coming up with an answer. And I don't know that they actually, in their hearts, have a hard time coming up with the answer, but they look around at each other like, huh, what could we like about our family? family. Like they can't let their friends know that they love their parents. And this is a particular issue with affluence. I don't see it anywhere else. Just in affluence. Those kids have a very, very challenging time. So that puts more pressure on those of you that are families of affluence. You have to be sure that your kids aren't going to be stumped when they're asked what's the best about you. You don't want them to write it's the new car. You know, that shouldn't be what's best about the family, all right? You want them to come up with something a little bit more, uh, with a little more heart to it than that, I think. Sometimes people say, me. And the place I'm most likely to have someone say that they're the best thing about the family is with the adults. <laughs> when I ask the kids what's the best thing about their families, they might say a little brother or a little sister. Very often, if there's a handicapped family member, the kids identify that person as the best person, the best thing about their family, very, very often. But with parents, like I say a lot of times, it might be, what's the best thing about your family? Oh, the mother. And here it is in the mother's handwriting, you know? Oh, the mother's the best thing about the family. So we want to really help our kids grab onto that and identify with you, for you, what we want our kids to think is that the family as a unit is more important than any one member as an individual. This is long-term thinking, that who we are together. If you're a family of 10 kids and the grandparents and the uncles and you're all living in the same house, that's the family. If you're a family where you're a mom or a dad with one child or two children or three children, you're the family. That's what you want to focus on. There's two other subjects I want to touch on. One was Saturday morning television, watching a Saturday morning television show and seeing a commercial that just was totally inappropriate for Saturday morning television. And what this mom said is, I'm going to write a letter to the, the sponsor. Do it. Do it. We have had in this country such an excellent example of what activism can create with the Dr. Laura issue. Dr. Laura offended some people in the United States and they activated as a group and they went to the sponsors of her new show, they went to people who have sponsored her radio show and they complained about what she said and they complained by writing letters and do you know that every sponsor pulled their spots from her new show because of these letter complaints? Now, we can do that. We can organize. 
as parents. If we think about feminism, I don't care what you think about feminism. If you think it was great or if you think it was awful, it doesn't matter. The fact of the matter is, is that feminism changed the world. It changed the world. And it started with small groups of women getting together at one another's houses and talking about the way things should be. We have to do that. Parents have to do that. We need to reach out to our friends. So many of you brought friends here tonight. We need to reach out to our friends and say, I don't like this. Do you like it? What can we do? We need to call each other up when there's parties and find out how that party's going to be supervised. Gee, I know you guys are great about this. How are you going to supervise the party? Can I come over and help? Can I chaperone for you? Because by the time they're in high school, you can't have a party with just one or two adults there. You need an army of adults at your house. You do. Let me tell you what the adults have to do. If you have a party, a high school age party at your house, you need an adult who's going to meet all the kids at the door, take their backpacks and their water bottles as they come in the door. You want everybody to hand you their backpack and everybody to hand you their water bottles because that's where the alcohol is. You, they, you put it in a room upstairs and you have an adult that's in that general vicinity throughout the evening. You need to have an adult that spends time going in and out of the room where the party is every three to five minutes, okay? Just walking through. Just going to drop off a bowl of chips, just going to bring a little ice, you need a little extra soda, just walking through. Oh, gee, I need something on the other side. I have to get something out of the closet. You have to be present in the room where the kids are a lot. So many parents have come up to me after nights like this, and they said, you know, I had a party, and I was really supervising it pretty well. I thought I was doing a great job until about 10 o'clock when my own child was slurring their words. You know. That party hasn't been adequately supervised. That's because they were sending the little sisters in with the chips and the soda instead of going in there themselves. Kids who are underage are going to bring alcohol with them probably from their family's house. They're not going to bring beer cans. They're going to bring vodka. Vodka is the drink of choice, especially for the middle school set. Okay? It, they think it can't be detected. It can't be caught. They feel pretty comfortable mixing it with a little soda, mixing it with a little OJ. Even with eighth graders, you've got to be supervising the parties. I have a whole stack of cards where what I ask the kids is to tell me their secrets. On the back of the cards, they have to make a list of all their secrets for me. You wouldn't believe some of the secrets I see. They're very honest. <laughs> um, and they make a little list of their secrets. And here again, today, I've got to tell you, more eighth graders than I would ever feel comfortable with had drinking down on the back of their cards as one of their secrets. So it's something we really do need to be careful about this. If you're having a party where they're driving to your house, you need to have several adults out in the area where the cars are, just hanging around. Okay, just sort of walking around, being present, so that they're not actually having sex in the cars, which, as we all very well know, happens. And uh, so that they're not uh, keeping their alcohol supply out in the car and going out there, you need to have adults out at the car. You need to have adults at the outside door of any door that they can get in and out of from the party room, outside in the yard, even if it's January. Not because we shouldn't trust our kids but because we understand the nature of being a kid and we need to set those boundaries up so that they don't give in to the temptation that they have. We're the guardians of that. We know they're tempted. We know they're tempted to have sex, so we don't leave our sons and their girlfriends home for three hours in the afternoon all by themselves. We know they're tempted to drink, so we supervise our parties very, very carefully. And when your child says to you, do you trust, what's the matter, don't you trust me? You say, this isn't a matter of trust. This is a matter of me doing my job as your parent. It doesn't have anything to do with trust. It has to do with the job I have. Why do we have this job? Who gave us this job? God gave us this job, you guys. He handed us this baby. Scripture says to us, for I knew you before you were in the womb. That means he planned these kids for us. They're not just random assortments that we received. This child was designed for us 
for us to raise, as easy or as hard as it is, this child was designed for us, whether it's our child by birth or through adoption, this child was designed for us to raise them by God. What does he want back? What does he want back? God sent you the person that showed you what love really is. Did you know what love was till you held it, your first baby in your arm? You had no idea. You thought you knew because you loved your husband or you loved your wife, but the baby thought you have the baby and you're listening to romantic songs on the radio and thinking of your baby. You're not thinking of your husband. Right? You love your child. Did you know how much love you could possibly have until you had your fourth or your fifth that you could just keep expanding for more? You didn't know that until this child came into your life because God sent them to you. What does he expect from us in return? He expects that our child will return to heaven to spend eternity with him. That's what he wants. He's given us this child so that we give this child back. And he tells us we don't know, sadly, when we're going to have to do that. We don't know. So we have to be prepared. The way we are prepared is by being sure that our child knows who God is and knows how to revere and respect God. And they learn that by expecting that they revere and respect us. Honor your mother and father is the commandment in the middle of the Ten Commandments. The first four commandments are about our relationship with God. They don't have anything to do with our relationships with each other. They have to do with our relationships with God. The last five commandments have to do with our relationships with each other. And honor your mother and father is the hinge. One of the things that we know about God is he does everything on purpose. There's a reason. Honor your mother and father is the hinge. We are the bridge for our children from their worldly life to their godly life. That's our job. We teach them about God. We show them the way to God. We show them how God loves them. And we show them that just naturally. How many parents have said to me, they tell me something really terrible that their child did, you know. Oh, my child just got arrested. They were selling drugs. They were into prostitution. They got in a drunk driving accident on the same night. But she's such a good girl, okay? That used to aggravate me. I used to think, you know, here's this parent saying their child is good when they're doing all these bad things. But I was wrong to be aggravated because the truth is, when our child does all those bad things and we say, they're such a good child, we're loving our child the way God loves us. God doesn't only love us when we're sin-free. Thank you, God, for that. God loves us even when we're bad. And he says to us, but you're so good. Stop being bad. He doesn't say to us, oh, but you're so good. You're such a good child. We'll ignore the bad things. He says, you're so good. Stop being bad. He said to the woman at the well, sin no more. Sin no more. He didn't say, oh, you're a doll. Sin all you want. He said, sin no more. That's what we say to our kids. I love you. You are so good. You are the, I love you more than anything. If you do that again, I'll kill you. Okay? That's how we love our kids. That's the way God loves us. We show our kids that way when we love them. God allows us to experience our consequences. How hard is that for us as parents? How much do we want to protect them? Make that call to that mean teacher, okay? How much do we want to say the bus driver is in the wrong? How much do we want to say it's that other bad kid they're hanging around with, okay? Oh, we have to say to our child, this is your consequence. I'm going to help you to experience it. I'm going to be sure that you learn. We can say to them, you know, this is a situation where I have to apply a consequence to you because you were out of line. 
You weren't supposed to do this. You were out of line. I have to apply a consequence to you. You know what we can say to them? I don't know what it is right now. I'll let you know when I figure it out. Delayed consequence is perfectly appropriate. Don't give them consequences when you're mad. When they come in and it's 1 o'clock in the morning and you're furious, don't say, you're grounded for a month. You'll never keep them grounded for a month, ever. When they're grounded, you're grounded. It doesn't work, okay? When they come in at 1 o'clock in the morning and you're so mad and you want to just yell and scream at them, you say, I'm so mad. If I say another word, I'm going to be yelling and screaming at you. I don't want to do that. We're going to bed. And you and I are going to discuss this later. And don't get up the next morning and discuss it. There is a John Rosemond uses the old phrase, let them stew in their own juices. <laughs> and I think that's really a great idea. You know, let them worry about it for a while. And then maybe a couple of days later, you say to them, you know, I haven't really actually figured out a really great consequence yet, but I'm working on it. I'll let you know when I have it. Okay? And then on Friday night when they come home and they say to you, oh, gee, at 7 o'clock there's a party. When are we going to eat? You say to them, here's your consequence, honey. There's no party tonight. And you let them know. Delayed consequence. That's how the real world works. If you make a mistake at work, your boss doesn't give you a consequence right away. You have to wait. You have to worry. So should our kids. We can also say to them that I am not sure what I should do right now. Do you have any ideas? What kind of consequence can I give you so that you will remember never to do this again? And you know what? They come up with harder stuff than we could. <laughs> and they worry about it. Like, if I make it too easy, will they make it hard? If I make it too hard, would they have done something easier? It's really good. It's a great thing to do. What can I do so you will remember never to do this again? Very, very effective. I heard at one time that when you uh, go and listen to a public speaker, you only remember three things that they said. Now, as a person who talks for two hours, that's a little disheartening <laughs> that you were going to remember three things. Three things I want you to remember, and they all begin with an L. Love your child. We talked about that. Lead your child. That's the God part. Take them to church. Pray at the dinner table. Pray at the dinner table. It's such a great thing to do. Hold hands when you pray. It's really nice to do that. And you'll find that when your kids' fr uh, friends comes over, they'll sit down and pray with you too. They won't care. They'll say, oh, that's what they do at their house. You know, we all have to pray. You know, they'll get used to it after a while. They won't care. So pray at the dinner table. And uh, let me suggest a little something about the prayer. You know, it's really nice, uh, bless us, O Lord, for these thy gifts. That's a lovely, lovely prayer. And I, that's what we use at our house. That's our particular favorite prayer. But we say that prayer, and then we add to it. We have add-ons. We always have people to pray for. We always have someone that we're concerned about. We have someone that's on our hearts, even maybe just that day. We have neighbors that need our prayers. We have friends that need our prayers. And we started off. Um, when we started off praying as a family, we haven't always done this. It's only been the last 10 years or so that we've done this. And when we started off praying as a family, my husband and I would bring in like what we wanted to pray for. You know, for, actually it was me. I started it all off. Ed caught on pretty quick. And we wouldn't let the kids say anything, okay? We wouldn't let them say anything. Then they wanted to. If we went around the table and we said, now, Steve, what would you like to pray for? He never would have said a prayer in his whole life. He would have just clammed right up. And Maggie, what would you like to pray for? She would have gone on for an hour and a half. So we didn't say, we said, OK, Dad and I are going to do this. That's the way it's going to be. And for three weeks, that's all we did. And then they couldn't stand it anymore. They said, come on, we have people we want to pray for, too. And so then we let them in. Once they asked us, we said, OK, you can pray, too. But they had to ask us. And every night somebody has something. And it got to the point where from never praying at all to we keep a list. We keep a list of who we pray for. We write it down. And we cross people off as our prayers are answered. So all of us, all four of us, every night at the dinner table, not only get to lift someone that we care about up in prayer, but we get to see that God answers our prayers too. And we get to see that he doesn't always answer them the way we asked. He answers them the way he knows is right. And that's an important lesson for us as adults to keep in our hearts as well as for us to teach our children. So we want to lead them. So we're going to love them. We're going to lead them. We're going to limit them. 
That's number three. And we especially want to limit them with the popular culture. We talked a little bit about TV. We talked a little bit about movies. I want to give you a little fact about movies that's kind of surprising. When Midnight Cowboy was first released, like when we were kids, Midnight Cowboy was first released, it was rated X. And it was rated X because of the scene in Midnight Cowboy where there's sex with a prostitute. Okay, that gave Midnight Cowboy an X rating. Forrest Gump, which was extremely popular family fair, had sex with a prostitute in it, and it was rated PG-13. That's how things have changed. Now, there's an old saying that if you want to cook a frog, if you put a frog in a pot of boiling water, the frog's going to jump right out. If you put a frog in a pot of water that's at room temperature and you raise the temperature one degree at a time, you're going to cook him. And that's what our popular culture has done to us. It's raised the temperature one degree at a time so that we think that it's the same. It doesn't feel any different to us, but it really is. So here's a little homework that if you're really brave to undertake. 10 days of no television, none, not a single show. Then do your flipping homework. We have been desensitized. If we resensitize ourselves by being away, we'll look at what we watch with a whole new eye. Now, I became sensitive to the problems with the popular culture when I went to get gas one day. I went into the station, and they had a rack of magazines for men, and they had a rack of magazines for women. And the men had all the cool stuff. They had, like, Inc. and Business Week and Car and Driver and Newsweek. And I bought every woman's magazine because I was so mad. I'm going to show you what I saw. This is every magazine on the woman's rack this day. Now, when a magazine is put in its little slots, and they want to get our attention. There's two places, here and here. Okay, those are the places that are going to be eye-catching. When you're in the grocery store, when you're someplace, you know, where all the magazines are in line. I'm going to read you what's there. This is a magazine called L, and it says, The Sex Issue, Lust in the 90s, What Women Want and When. I personally took this very badly. I said, how would some author know what I want and when I want it? There's one person on the planet who knows that, and I'm married to him, and he didn't write this story. So <laughs> it, I knew that they were going to be off on that one. Here's Glamour, the best sex I ever had. Here's Marie Claire. Men and sex, can you tell how many lovers he's had? One of the guys had like 700. It was gross, yeah. Uh, of course, I read it, you know. <laughs> okay. Mademoiselle, sex file, survey, 700 women tell us everything. And new woman, sex, secret spots that will drive you and him wild. I was furious. The men get the cool stuff. The only thing the women are going to talk about is sex? Is there more to life than that? I think so. The magazines haven't caught on. So I started talking about the magazines in schools and talking to parents about the magazines. And one day, I had a mother call me up and say, um, I'd like to meet you for coffee. My daughter has something to give you. And I go over and meet this mother for coffee, and her daughter gives me all of her young and modern magazines. <laughs> she was clearing them out of the house, never to have them again, and I'm going to show you a random selection of some of their covers so you can understand this mother's concerns. Young and Modern Magazine is marketed starting at fifth grade. Now, I want you to imagine in your mind a fifth grade girl. She's pre-puberty. She has her nice little straight up and down body. She thinks boys are gross, still in fifth grade. She has not yet started to think of herself as a woman. She thinks of herself as a girl. They're little in fifth grade. They're pure in fifth grade. They're wonderful in fifth grade. And that's when this magazine 
markets. Bonus booklet, Your Love Horoscope. Hold on to his heart, 25 no-fail ways. Love secrets, sneaky moves guys can't resist, how he wants to be kissed, and flirt alert, are you doing it right? They don't even know you can do it wrong. The hot bod workout, get buff fast. <laughs> they don't even have breasts. Kissing lessons from real guys. How to look hot in a bikini. Boys blab what turns them off. Go get him, guy snagging moves that really work. Fifth grade. Guy alert, how to spot a heartbreaker. Get sexy, 101 ways to look and feel like a total babe. Love crisis, we solve your boy problems. You want YM solving your daughter's boy problems? I don't think so. Catch your crush. 16 ways to find summer love now. And the Spice Girls on smooching sweeties and embarrassing moments. I wonder to myself, what can embarrass girls that wear their underwear on stage? <laughs> I don't know. We're going to have a love test and get your guy snagging style. We're going to have popularity truths and lies. In girls spill their dirty little secrets. How do you think that makes someone feel who has a lot of friends? Not very good, I bet. Hot date handbook. Guys blab the top eight things they love on a date. Surefire ways to make any romance rock and cool moves that get you asked out again and again. Steamy love confessions and say anything catastrophes. I have to tell you the story about this. We go skiing with another family who, who has a uh, um, nephew who's a very good friend of our son's, and they have a daughter who's the same age as our, as our daughter. And we go skiing together once a year. And this is a couple of years. This is from two years ago. And we got there that night, and our friends come up from the city, and their daughter brought her YM magazine. But uh, we didn't know that, OK? Uh, my husband and I didn't know that. But what we see throughout the evening is the two boys in hysterics. I mean hysterics. They're falling off the chairs. They're laughing so hard. They go into their room and they are guffawing in a way I've almost never heard them laugh before. They were beside themselves with hilarity for most of the evening. And we didn't know why. We thought they were just, you know, being themselves and having a good time. So it gets to be bedtime and everybody's getting ready for bed. And Steve comes to me like this. And he comes to my door and he knocks on our door and he says, uh, Mom, and I open the door and he hands this into my room like this. I don't think you want Maggie to get a hold of this magazine. So I said, oh, and I opened it up and it's YM Magazine. And this is what Maggie's friend had brought with her. And steamy love confessions and say anything catastrophes is what they were laughing so hard about. And they were laughing because people, girls write in, girls write in their stories about embarrassing things that happen when they're having sex with their boyfriends. Like, oh, I was uh, giving my boyfriend head and he had gas. This is what's in this magazine. In this magazine that they market to fifth grade girls. Now our teenage boys thought it was the funniest thing they ever saw in their whole life. But I wouldn't have in a million years wanted my 10 year old daughter to have a hold of that. I'm glad that my son had the good sense to be sure she didn't get it. Now we're going to get Drew and Luke in love a sexy scoop on their secret selves. And now Drew's in love with Tom Green. She's not in love with Luke anymore, so that didn't really last too long. So that's why I am. Are, we sh are you shocked? Mm -hmm. OK. How did that happen? Well, here's the frog in the pot, you guys. It's Red Book. All right. This is a random sampling of Red Book magazine. Now, when my kids were babies, Red Book was about uh, parties, recipes, and fiction. That was what Red Book was about when my kids were small. 
This is a random selection of red books, and I'm going to read two things off of every cover and just see if you notice a theme as I do this. Your 39 most embarrassing love questions answered and burn fat faster at 25, 35, and 45. Passion, seven ways to make him yearn for you and forbidden treats that take off pounds. That feels great, the sex skill every woman should know and slim down fast by breaking one habit. The fastest way to lose two, five, or 10 pounds, and a love and sex guide. Six secret places he'd love you to touch and burn fat faster. <laughs> if we could figure out how to do both of those things at the same time, we'd be in good shape. 23 ways to make him insane with desire and lose five pounds in a week. Oh, here we have another. 23 ways to make him wild in bed and how to eat thin in a fat world. 15 secrets of sexy wives and the trick that takes off 20 pounds. Sex quiz, are you too bashful or bossy in bed and how to drop a quick 10 pounds. This is the frog in the pot right here, Red Book Magazine. We need to limit our child's cultural exposure in any way that we can. Are you gonna fight about it with them? Probably. <laughs> They're not gonna be happy when you say, oh no, honey, you can't go to that R-rated movie. Or, gee, guess what, no TV tonight. We're gonna talk. We're gonna play Monopoly. We're gonna play Scrabble. We're gonna hang around on the floor together and see who can laugh the hardest. We're gonna see if your big brother can laugh till the milk comes out of his nose. <laughs> Those are the kinds of things you wanna be doing as a family, <laughs> rather than plugging in. Sure, there's stuff we wanna plug into that we can sit down and watch together. Watch together. Ask your child what their favorite shows are and watch them with them and see what you think about those favorite shows. <laughs> so, love them, lead them, and limit them. Those are the three things I'd like you to remember from tonight. Now in order to lead them, this is your last homework. We need to pray ourselves in order to lead our children. And in your folders, I gave you two little helps for praying. One is called praying for your child, and that's praying that's specific. It's scripture. There are scripture tracks is what they are. And when you kneel to pray, that's what I want you to do. I don't want you to sit to pray. I don't want you to lay down in your bed to pray. I want you to kneel to pray. And when you kneel to pray, you're going to think of the best example we as parents could have for intercessory prayer. And that's my good friend Moses. I'm gonna tell you a little story about Moses from my perspective, just because he was such a great prayer. And we can use him as an example. Let's compare Moses' situation to ours. When God came to Moses, God wanted Moses to free the Israelites from Egypt. Moses said to God, you got the wrong guy. I don't have the skills. Okay? And God said, I got the right guy. I'll give you the skills. He says that to us as parents. How many times have we thought, I'm not equipped for this. I can't have this conversation. I can't invoke this discipline. I can't do this. God will give us the skills the same way he gave it to Moses. Moses had millions of miserable Israelites. He had Israelites. He had the cows, the goats, the tents, the kids, the wives, the food, the sacrifices. And those Israelites weren't happy for one minute of 40 years. They were hungry, they were thirsty, they were tired, they were in the desert. When were they gonna get there? They had to go to the bathroom. All of those troubles. 40 years Moses spent with them. Those millions of miserable, miserable Israelites. 40 years in the desert responsible for them. They disobeyed him. They lost their way. They went way off track. And Moses threw himself face down on the earth 
to intercede on their behalf. Every day, 40 years. Our kids leave home when they're 18. None of you have a million of them in your house. God listened to Moses and got those Israelites into the promised land. He got them there. We have that same job. We need to get our kids into the promised land. And we do that by interceding on their behalf every single day. Kneel down. 15 minutes on your knees for your kids. Bring your kids to God by name. This is my daughter. This is my son. Thank you. I don't know what to do about them, though. <laughs> Help me. <laughs> this is their strength. This is their weakness. Help us. Show us the way. Help us take this child where you want them to go. God sees your child's life as a whole entity. He can show us the path. The Bible promises us he'll make our path straight. The Bible tells us if we can save one sinner from the error of his ways, we will save a soul from death. We are all sinners. We need to save our kids from the error of their ways. Now, one of my favorite verses is, the effective, fervent prayer of the righteous avails much. And you'll see that on your handouts. The effective, fervent prayer of the righteous avails much. So I've always said that. I always like that. I thought, because I'm fervent. As you can probably tell, I'm a fervent person. And I'm fervent. But um, I got a really better one yesterday, talking on the telephone. And someone very near and dear to me, who is a great prayer warrior on my behalf, said, you know, God always listens to sinners. <laughs> That might be better for us. Maybe it's hard for us to imagine that we're righteous. Maybe it's hard for us to be fervent. But he listens to us. And he perks his ears up even when we sin. We can bring our child exactly to the foot of the cross. Because that was where the sacrifice was made for your eternal life and the life of your child. What I want you to remember, three things. Love this child so they can feel it. Lead them exactly where they need to go, right to the Lord, and limit their exposure to things that can harm them. Thank you very much.